You're about to join Jerry Parker, Maritz Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Jerry Parker, Moritz Siebert, and I, Niels Kostrup Larsen, are back with this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series which is our weekly ongoing raw exploration of the world of rules-based investing and, of course, where we also take some of your questions. But today, we're going to deviate a bit from our usual format because we are delighted to be joined by a very special guest, namely Wayne Himmelsign, who has fast become a dear Twitter friend and a go-to resource for financial poetry in 140 characters when we need it. So let me start by saying uh, welcoming to uh, to you, Wayne. How are you? Thank you. I'm good. Thank you. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. And as usual, I'm going to say good morning to you, Jerry, or good afternoon, actually, Jerry, today, and good afternoon to you, Moritz. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you guys are. Hey, guys. It's uh, actually 280 characters now, Niels. There we are. Yeah, That's 280. Uh, I use all 280. Wayne seldom needs to. So <laughs> <laughs> Now, it's, of course, really great to uh, have you with us today, uh, Wayne, and we look very much forward to diving into your world and how you approach the current environment and, of course, your take on rules-based investing and, and much more. But before we do, we normally do just a quick review of the past week from the lens of a trend follower. So while you have an extra sip of your coffee, we will cl- uh, quickly run through these uh, highlights from this week. I hope that sounds okay with you. It does. My coffee is getting cold. Okay, good stuff. <laughs> now, so, but in order to get as much time with, uh, with Wayne, we'll probably do a slightly shorter roundup uh, of this week's action and looking at the markets. It was a kind of, uh, kind of a week divided into two camps from where I uh, sit. Financials going up in general, commodities going down, broadly speaking, with the extremes being a rise of 12% in the VIX, a bit unusual perhaps with the stock markets also advancing. And at the other end of the spectrum, we saw a tough week for the meats, uh, where lean hawks uh, dropped 10% and live cattle dropped 5%. So with that in mind, Moritz, uh, why don't we jump into it and see how that all uh, played out? Yeah, great. I mean, I had an all-round great week, I think. Uh, sunny weather here and a good performance. Uh, I think I made 45 maybe 5% uh, this past week. So a bit of a uh, you know recovery from the from the weeks that we discussed earlier. Um, nice nice to see it working that way. Um, pretty much all the money made from uh, from the currencies in 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 my instance here. Uh, we had some you know big moves lower in the euro, in the Aussie dollar, in the Swiss franc, all against the U.S. dollar. That was great. Still you know as the weeks before, along all the bond futures, uh, short gold, short silver, all of that worked. Some losses from uh, being short a few of the energy markets still, although, although you know, those positions have become relatively small over the past couple of weeks. So great week. Yeah, I mean, I'll echo the great week uh, for sure. Um, but it's so funny to listen to your run through and then I look at my uh, P&Ls and, uh, and um, they're somewhat different. I mean, for us, uh, certainly the main driver uh, was still uh, fixed income. Um, did really well. What was interesting also, though, and, and actually quite good to see, was it was a very healthy week in terms of breadth of the portfolio. Uh, we had something like 80% of the markets we trade in positive territory. Um, grains did really well. Uh, a little bit of gains, of course, also on the currencies from our side. Uh, equities were, you know, slightly up. Um, the biggest uh, troublemaker for the week and the only real troublemaker for the week was, in fact, uh, live cattle. Uh, long positions uh, in, the, in, in live cattle um, cost money uh, as, as the market came off 5%. Um, but all in all, pretty good. And uh, yeah, so far we're, you know, it looks like the recovery from uh, back in November lows uh, continues. What about you, uh, Jerry? How was your week? A uh, good week with the dollar making new highs, uh, grain markets, new lows. Happy that uh, the silly crash we saw in platinum, uh, that market rallied. 
But we got another silly two crashes in the cattle and the hogs. So I'm certainly blaming all of that on indiscriminate selling by crazy CTAs or fall targeters or whoever I can blame. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so hopefully the plague of crazy selling and indiscriminate large selling will not uh, continue in the meat markets. Absolutely. Now, of course, uh, as we talked about before uh, we, we pressed record, is that there there has been in this week a lot of articles uh, coming out about uh, trend following uh, kind of, you know, good or bad. Um, things that we do want to comment on, uh, rest assured on that. But this week, um, we will focus on on the fact that we have Wayne on on uh, on our uh, podcast, uh, and therefore we'll come back to a lot of the questions that were sent in. Uh, we'll we'll pick those up next week, um, and of course, as I said, the uh, articles will also uh, comment on next week. So Wayne, perhaps to frame our conversation today, I think it's always a good thing to understand a bit about your background, how you got to where you are today, and perhaps also what influenced uh, you, uh, you know, along the way, if you don't mind, take us back to the time where it all got, uh, all got started. Sure, I, w- I would love to. Um, so go back to 1995. Uh, it was the middle of the 90s bull market. <laughs> and uh, I came out of school, went out to New York. I, I think I wanted to, I was always interested in being a trader. So from the very beginning, uh, I guess as a kid, I was following stocks and really interested in the market. I was also very mathematical. So um, kind of had a quantitative bent all my life. Um, and so in graduating, I went right out to Wall Street and wanted to trade. Uh, in, in doing so, I was lucky enough to arrive at a good shop. I was, it was a proprietary trading firm called Carlin Financial. Uh, the uh, Interestingly, the head of the firm, a guy named Ron Shear, uh, he had been a floor trader on the Amex for um, a lot of his life. And uh, interestingly started uh, Millennium Capital with Izzy Englander. So the two of them had started Millennium early on. Uh, what was funny is that in the first few years, Millennium, though it's amazing today, uh, in the first few used years did not do so well. So the two of them, I guess, parted ways. Uh, Izzy continued on building Millennium and Ron went on to open up this, this other firm, Carlin. So uh, of course, um, Millennium went on to become one of the biggest, best hedge funds in the world. And Carlin was, uh, of course, a very different kind of shop, but an interesting prop trading firm. So I was lucky enough to get there and um, certainly had Ron as a mentor. Uh, and it, it really, the, the opportunity was amazing in that uh, sitting on this prop floor, Everybody around me had a tremendous amount of experience. I was a kid out of college, and I'm sitting there with people who, um, you know, the guy on my left had been trading on the floor for 15 years, and now was just sitting trading a, a, a book for the firm and his own. Uh, the guy on my right had been at Lehman Brothers for 12 years. And so here I am as a kind of as a kid, just immersed in all this knowledge. And um, me being the kind of curious and uh, just buggy kid that I am, I went around just asking a lot of questions. And as it always is, when you sit there asking questions to people who are very experienced, some of them kind of shush you away, and others take you in under their wing and and really want to teach and share. So uh, I gravitated, of course, to those people. And over the course of a few years, learned a lot. I, I absorbed a tremendous amount just because I was so lucky to be in a room full of smart people and experienced people that uh, where many of them took the time to teach. And I, as a person, uh, I'm a intent listener and absorber of information. Um, so put gave in my all for listening and absorbing more than I even did trading. In fact, I was asked on several occasions to start trading, but I I, I didn't want to. I wanted to just talk and listen. And, and that helped me a lot. So one of the things I noticed early on, it was, um, it was interesting being an outsider, if you will, uh, in the sense that uh, I'm a kid out of college at the same time. Um, you know, I, I, there's all these people that are, that know what they're doing. And I, I'm, so I'm looking from a objective view, uh, being kind of a learner in that environment. And what I saw was really interesting. One of the first things that stood out for me was that across this desk, so many people were doing so many different kinds of things, right? So um, just, I I could sit there and talk to one trader for a while and they were doing statistical arbitrage and they would explain to me, you know, how they find pairs and 
long Coke, short Pepsi. And, and this is why they loved it. And, and every single person I spoke to, um, well, not every one of them, but many of them were doing so many different kinds of things. And yet they were all good at it or not all good, but uh, many of them made money consistently. Sure. Everybody had losing days or losing weeks or losing periods. That that's, that's of course. But the, the big point was for me as this new kid on the block was that th there was no magic bullet that so many different kinds of strategies worked um, and, and were successful. It's just kind of how they did it. So uh, in, in, in looking across the spectrum of approaches or, or, or styles, I noticed that there were some things that were consistent among many. And that was uh, primarily at the core money management discipline uh, in the, so that no matter what somebody was doing, whether stat arb or momentum or relative value or whatever kinds of, or fixed income, uh, futures traders, all of them, the ones that used, uh, or all of them used a money management discipline, a, an approach to deal with winners and losers. And those that focused more on that, that had their, their, their constraints around this discipline were the more successful ones. So I quickly realized that making money in the market wasn't necessarily the the signal you used or the style of picking, but more the, the discipline around uh, that approach. And so that was, I, I call it my my epiphany moment or my key insight was, wow, the, you know, I, I got to focus on that and then let me find a strategy. So that, that's the starting point. Um, as far as finding a strategy, the, the, the interesting thing for me that was that a lot of people uh, – we're doing things that were more contrarian. Uh, when I say contrarian, from value investing, picking deep value that is supposed to turn around uh, to a lot of the, uh, call it pairs trading or relative value, or really all the arbitrage approaches were contrarian in nature um, in the sense that you, you have a, let's say a, a stat arb or relative value arb is going to be long Coke, short Pepsi. I used that example earlier. So Coke is the overvalued one and Pepsi is the undervalued one. So they're going short overvalued and long undervalued. Or if they're price volume behavior, they're going long strength, short weakness, or uh, sorry, the opposite would be contrarian, would be um, shorting the over uh, bought and, and buying the oversold. For, for, for a contrarian uh, kind of reversion to the mean, uh, as it's called. So for, for me, seeing a lot of this uh, across uh, a lot of different styles and being a little bit of an out-of-the-box person myself, I said, you know what, I, I want to try the opposite. I want to try a ex mean expansion approach. Uh, I, the, the idea that, uh, in fact, if you look at a lot of these stat arb or relative value arb portfolios, a lot of the time, managers or, or, or um, the, the portfolios get into positions that go against them for longer than they think. So they see a pair that, quote unquote, is supposed to come back, that's supposed to revert to the mean, and they get into that pair. And, and for the next couple of days or weeks or months, it continues expanding. Now, eventually, they all come back. And there's, if there's a whole portfolio of the stuff, 30, 40, 50, or 100 positions, however many they have, on average, they're all reverting to the mean. But the new ones they get into are off, oftentimes continue expanding longer than they expect before the reversion. So my idea became to trade that expansion, kind of get the outliers of, of all these standard um, uh, ex expectations to revert. So I started a uh, combining an approach of momentum or trend following with uh, pair trading, which was novel at the time. Uh, and I, I did so mathematically. I used my quantitative skills and uh, things I'd learned from m many traders on the floor uh, about how to model and, and approach the markets in that way. I, I developed some... I'll call it indicators or signals to find high quality momentum or trends, uh, and then did so in a pairing nature, uh, where if I found the the, the strong Coca Cola, I'd want to find the short, uh, the the weaker Pepsi. And when I say strong and weak, it was all on a trend basis. Um, and in, so I started doing this for a while. I think it was about 1997. I uh, had my first big correction come uh, the uh, August 98. Um, called, the, I guess we call it the Asian flu or uh, whatever it was back then. It was LTCM blew up at that time, uh, caused big havoc in the markets. 
And in going through that, it, so that was my first, of course, major experience with using the disciplines that I learned. Um, I spoke at the very beginning about the money management disciplines. That's where I saw it really pan out because um, when momentum cracks or when trends crack, they can go fast and sharp. Um, and, and so my experience with that was uh, that I had to get out quickly, wait for things to reestablish themselves, and then kind of move my way back in when I, when I saw some consistency coming back. And in doing that, I learned very quickly that that's the thing that has to be done, um, is controlling that left tail. I didn't know it at the time as, as the left tail problem and negative skew, and I didn't understand all of that in, at, during those years. But intuitively, it made sense to me. And, and so, uh, and of course, from the experience that I explained earlier, um, that that's what had to be done. So I, I got into a habit and an understanding of that early on and uh, continued on running that strategy. I, I um, did very well in, in that environment. I did so well, in fact, that people on the floor came up to me and said, hey, you should start a hedge fund. And so I did. My first hedge fund started in 1999 uh, towards the end, which was this, this model, trend following stat arb, which is r really different. It was uh, all statistical arbitrage at the time was mean reversionary and mine was mean expansionary. It was finding pairs that would continue expanding against everybody else's expectations. Uh, there were fewer pairs in the portfolio. So a, a typical stat arb portfolio might have 50 pairs. I only had 10 or 20 because uh, I had to find the outliers that would continue going. Um, I, I used the S&P 500 universe, the constituents, as my universe. I wanted large liquid names. And um, and in trading this, did as I said, did very well both on the long and the short side. Uh, I got seeded some capital from at the time Millennium, which is of course one of the better hedge funds at that point, um, and that really launched me into the the, the uh, a strong career. Um, and I can keep on going. Should I continue? Or uh, I, really, that's the yeah, no, answer. Absolutely. Yeah, sure, sure. yeah, sure, sure. No, I mean it's it's always interesting to to hear the background and 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 then how it all uh, pans out. So starting your own hedge fund is that really what? you've been doing then ever since or has there been any changes along the way um I, i've definitely been involved in my own hedge funds uh, for ever since um what's changed along the way are uh kind of the, the different strategies so i've evolved in my thinking obviously we, we all evolve as as humans and especially uh, being uh uh ones who are learners and educators um, so in, in doing so, I, I, I think in the beginning, I, I thought I'd found uh, my version of the Holy Grail of saying, oh my gosh, everybody's doing it this way and I'm going to do it this way. And, and it worked really well. So I thought I was a hero. And of course, things changed in, I think it was around 2002, my returns got soft and I, 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 don't, I wasn't really losing a lot of money. I just wasn't making anymore. I'd gone from the mid-teens annualized to, uh, or even the high teens annualized, I'd come down to the low single digits. So I think in 2002, I did about 8% on the year. And in 03, I did 4% on the year. So there was, and in doing so, started losing some of my institutional capital. Uh, when they're asking me what happened, uh, I, I couldn't explain it. I'm, well, it's, you know, it's not working as well, was my answer. And, but I didn't know why. Of course, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm researching day in and day out. Uh, but so what, I, what that lesson taught me uh, was this grand idea that um, sometimes things don't always work. Markets can have regimes or, or environments for for months or even years where things aren't uh, ideal for a particular type of strategy. And um, of course, everybody here is trend followers. They we, trends go through trends. I guess to put it that way, right? Is we can we can have a strong trending environment like 2014, and then we can have a, a weaker year, uh, that, you know, in 2018. Um, so it's 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 hard to uh, in seeing that I, I realize that it's hard to stick with one consistent approach when the markets don't necessarily allow that. Uh, and, and therefore, I started building other types of strategies. I, I said, okay, I have this basic understanding. Let me, let me see what else I can do now. And so uh, in, in 05, I developed another strategy that worked really well. I ran that for about six years um, and raised a lot of capital and, and, and had a really good run. Uh, and then that didn't uh, that kind of faded or had some decay to it, didn't, didn't work as well come uh, 2010, 2011. Uh, so then I, I started some, uh, some other approaches. And when I say started other approaches, I continued to run the, the other things I did. So my mean expansion 
pairs trading strategy, which I, I explained earlier that I kind of started modeling in 1997, that's still running today. And so I've been doing that for uh, over 20 years now. And it, I've seen it go through many market environments. Uh, I've seen it do incredibly well. Uh, in 2017, um, I, I, it's, by the way, it's no longer long and short. So I, I, I saw over time that it uh, it got a lot more alpha on the long side than the short side. So I, I, um, I moved to dropping the short side of the portfolio having the long side and then built a, a short portfolio around uh, optionality. So I, I prefer using options for shorts rather than uh, equities. Uh, and that's, that has to do with a, a asymmetry of, of movements, right? So options allow convexity and uh, st- equities drop fast and, and, and magnitudes are much larger on the downs than the ups. So I like options as a tool for capturing the, the downside moves and then use equities to capture the upside moves. So I, I, I changed the system a little bit, but generally the same approach. But th- that long book has been running. I had, it's had its poor period, as I explained earlier in, in 02, 03, it, it went out of favor. It was out of favor for many years, in fact, with slow returns. But then it started picking up again. In fact, had a decent year in 08 and um, started coming back 09 forward. It's been great. And in 2017, I had a 53% year, which was phenomenal. Um, and and so th- and that's the, effectively the same system I developed in 1997, which is trend following. Uh, and 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 so I love it. And I, and and I love it. And I know it works. And it's based deeply in human nature. And uh, and there's nothing much that can change my mind about how powerful that is and how much the that um, kind of um, the crowd behavior works in the markets. It's it's fundamental to, uh, p- uh, to to the markets. People talk about markets, but markets at the end of the day are, are just humans, and humans tend to do the same thing over and over forever. So that one I like. But then w- during the times that it is not behaving or not ideal for the environment, you need other things. And so um, in 2011, uh, I, I I developed several. I started developing. I put a group of uh, of people together and um, some PhDs and um, and some traders that I worked with. And we all just got together and started building some new strategies. And we, we did that for many years and built a, a really cool tail strategy that only makes money on market downs. Uh, we built a um, kind of a sector rotation strategy. And so all these things are meant to complement um, the different market regimes. And, and, and all of them have, of course, the same overarching thesis of risk management and, and a money management discipline, ride winners, cut losers, uh, which is, uh, of course, the, the, the core of trend following. Uh, but they approach the markets in different ways and therefore do well uh, during different kinds of regimes. And that, so that's where I am now is with a, 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 a range of a few strategies meant for different environments. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Wayne. I'm sure there's a lot more we can dig into on that, but I'm going to pass it on to to Jerry to uh, to come up with some some other thoughts and and topics. Yeah, that's we you know we just uh, love your tweets and it's uh, you're way more of a trend follower than we thought. I mean, I shouldn't be surprised because we hold trend followers in such high regard as the smartest people on the planet, and so. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it's, it is interesting how I mean, when I started reading your tweets and I did a lot of uh, retweets that I wasn't really sure. And it's not nece- necessary all the time because I feel like I get a lot of uh, <clears throat> similar ideas from uh, Howard Marks and other people who are way different than trend following CTAs. But this core principles that you've been mentioning, uh, it seems to be the one thing that everyone who survives um, picks up and and thinks is important. But, uh, you know, you, you talk a lot about emotions and positive skew, managing risk, managing losses, puts, uh, patience, trade, trade, trade. And um, so I was just wondering, um, what are some of the big lessons other than the ones you've already spoke of that um, that you've learned over the years? And do you have uh, rules and processes to make sure you don't make those same mistakes? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I, I think a lot of it is, I think, things that I've touched on already. I mean, at, at, again, to repeat, and the, I, I'm going to repeat it, but one can repeat this a thousand times and it still wouldn't be enough, is at the core of everything is the money management discipline, is, is knowing that we don't know. Um, and I, I think when I was a younger trader I, I, and being kind of a, a mathematical person, um, 
I, I believed in probabilities. And uh, as I grew older and more mature, I realized that um, there, there are, yeah, there, <laughs> probabilities are, are a decent place to start, but the future is uncertain. And uh, I mean, I, I'd say that with every, you know, every time you have a, you know, a 60% edge or, you know, in trading, it can only be a 53% edge. But as long as you have a positive edge, you, you keep on taking that bet. Um, just like sitting down at a, at a blackjack table, you, you keep on taking that bet when the odds are in your favor. But when, that doesn't mean that something drastic is not going to happen. And uh, uh, it, it happens all the time because that's the markets. And we, we, can't, uh, we, we, we can't know, uh, we, 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 but we can continue to do the right thing. So what I've learned is that we, is to go in the trade with conviction, try to get the best odds we can, take the 68% bet over the 52, that's for sure. Uh, but don't expect that it's going gonna, it's gonna to work out. So when you enter a trade with that uh, level of uncertainty or that feeling that everything can go wrong tomorrow, you, you always do so, I think, with a lot more um, conservatism. And what that means is when I enter a trade, I say, how am I going to protect this? How, what, what's the other side? And yes, I might even be 90% sure, but still, what's the other side? How do I have it covered? And so I, I think the, the grand lesson, uh, or, I mean, there's so many of them, but it's, it's knowing that the future is uncertain and it's preparing preemptively before any trade uh, that, that everything is going to go exactly the opposite to what you think, no matter how convicted you are uh, and no matter how much you, you, you understand what's going on. Um, so with that in mind, I think I've, I've built a lot of strategies that are preemptively pre preparing. Um, and that includes not just the rules, which say if this, you know, knowing bef before you get in that if this goes to some level or, you know, I, I guess when I was younger, I used to use levels. Now I, I, I just, I, I identify the thesis in a trade and I say, if it breaks the thesis, I'm, I'm gone. Uh, and so, and, and I think levels are also another good way to do that. Um, uh, but it's to use some form of uh, this is how much pain I'm willing to take and, and, then, and then I'm done and I move on. Uh, that's step yeah. one. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, when I was, uh, I also uh, was really liking what you were saying earlier about mentors and uh, learning, and I had great mentors. I mean, I wouldn't be where I am today without these mentors teaching me way more good stuff than they should have. And um, I remember um, being in, in this uh, environment and some of the other people who were beneficiaries of these mentors would, if we had a bad day or we lost money, they would immediately assume, well, uh, this is unreasonable because these guys are so smart because uh, they're, they're withholding information from us. So it's this silly idea that uh, I think you were hitting on it, which just because you have a good idea and you have an edge doesn't mean you're going to, you're not going to suffer uh, some bad days and bad periods. And you need to uh, be very humble and willing to uh, ass assume that you may not have it exactly right this time. Yeah, I love that word, humble. I, I think I, I very often tweet and say, I use the word humility. I, I can't stress enough is I, I, I'm, that I so much agree with that. And I, I used to, I, I think I talked earlier um, when, I, when I had built this first strategy and I'm, I'm sitting on this desk and I'm this young kid, but I've built something that is working better than a lot of these much older guys around me and, and, or people around me. And and I th I thought I was a hero, and I, I I go out to start my first hedge fund, and I get capital from a major group at the time, and I, I think I'm like wow, I, I'm you know, I, and nothing can go wrong until it did, and for me that that really cemented the lesson that there there are no heroes in the I mean in the market, you 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 have to um, be really humble all the time and. Uh, know that everything can go against you. You can go through with a great strategy. I mean, talk about trend following. It's it's an amazing strategy. It's right skewed. That's one of the best things that one can uh, do in the market. But you can have years of of soft performance, and there could be high uh, volatile in the market. Markets that are really choppy that that don't offer trends for you to to, to establish. And and uh, still the the right way to do things is still what you're doing, but the markets aren't giving you that opportunity for a while. So that's where the humility kicks in and, and you say to yourself, you know what, I know I'm doing right and let me just continue. And of course you have to uh, add in some R&D and you know, where can we improve? And is, you wonder, is our markets going to be like this forever? And has human nature changed? And uh, all these things go through your head. And meanwhile, you, so, so you try to evolve, uh, but, but it's all about having that, um, of course, that, that discipline and, and, uh, and, uh, and doing things the right way.
Yeah, do the hard thing, do the right thing. Um, I know one time they were our guy, our mentors were really interested in sending over a question, a uh, one sentence question, and you had to answer in one sentence. And once we got this question, and I had no idea what the question was. It was, uh, do should you do this or should you uh, exercise uh, conservative money management and reduce your positions when you lose? So I knew the answer was number two. I just didn't understand what number one meant. So right. I think uh, that's well-learned lessons. Yeah. I have a funny mentor story. It's kind of was, um, I mean, it's, it's a very short story. It's, uh, I, I was at, at the desk, at the trading desk and I was, uh, I was long, I think this was the late, yeah, it was still the late 90s. So I was long Dell, of course, which was the high flyer of the late 90s and had a lot of uh, strong trend, a lot of momentum. And uh, I was long the name and I, I got up to go to the restroom and I, I'm in the bathroom and and, and uh, one of my mentors walks in and says, what the hell are you doing in the bathroom when you're when you're long, uh, long only a thousand shares? Get out of here. And I'm like, I got you know, I got to go to the restroom. He said, "Well, then you should have exited your position first. Uh, he, he kind of screaming at me. And I've, I mean, of course, that's a little bit extreme. But as a new trader, that's not extreme. He was he was concreting into my mind or uh, stamping into my head that the, the, like you you just you can't take any risk. And so it's I, I'll never forget it because he he came in. I didn't kind of um, put it out as aggressively as, as he was when he walked in the bathroom. He, he used a bunch of cuss words and um, uh, which I don't know if I can say on a podcast. So I won't. Uh, but it, it, it I won't. I'll say that that moment stuck with me for the rest of my life is like, really, anything can happen in five in three minutes. <laughs> Right, uh, and, and and hence, um, I guess perhaps that bathroom moment made my uh, made my career. Who knows? Funny, yeah. Like what you said about you know we know that we do not know, and I hundred percent agree with that. And the markets have this fantastic way of uh, you know humbling us if we overtrade, um, if we do the wrong thing, if we have bad money management. And you know one of the things that you know that I always either think about is stay diversified, right? as diversified as possible, Rodel. So my question is, uh, you know, one of the questions I have quite a few, you know, we're talking about stocks. Do you trade anything else but stocks or do you try to get diversification within the large universe of stocks? Yeah, so um, I trade stocks and options uh, and options on indices and on single stocks, so, uh, but mostly indices. And um, for me, the, the word diversification, I guess I have... Um, positive and negative feelings about it in that I, I, I don't love diversification for the sake of diversification um, and in the sense that I find that there's too much acceptance of lower quality um, uh, additions to a portfolio for the sake of diversification. In the, in the market neutral world, for example, you see these portfolios that are 200 by 200 names and it's just not possible to have 400 good picks, right? I mean, the the, the 400th or the 399th, by definition, is is a lower signal than the than the top five. Uh, and and so I think, that, yeah, that's a right approach. The idea is it's very uh, Vegas like that if you you have a 52% edge, you just keep on pulling the machine, right? You keep on uh, repeating, and and so over time that plays out. But um, I, I I think that I've seen more. Uh, decay in quality by just pure diversification. So for me, diversification has a different word, has a different meaning in the sense that diversifying away from market exposure and um, maybe sector or factor exposure. And I, I do that a lot of the time with with optionality. And I love optionality for the downside uh, because, the, as I said earlier, the downside in markets is, is again, a, a great representation of human behavior. We, we are more scared more quickly than we are happy, right? Our fear is more intense than our, than our happiness. So markets move down faster and sharper than they ever move up. Uh, and so... Uh, to take advantage of that that magnitude and that speed, optionality for me has become the winner. Uh, and and it's not in a lot of positions; it's just a few. So, in, in 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 as an example, I can have a portfolio of 
10 long names uh, that are all high conviction. And so I'm, I'm taking, it's almost like a, a venture capital fund would, is you, you, you have a, um, a, a few really, really good bets, and each of them are high right skew potential. Um, so large payoffs that you're waiting for this, these home runs. Uh, and then I have exposure to this market that I just, going back to the, we don't know what we don't know, and it could be another December of 2018 tomorrow when the market's down, if the market's down, uh, or starts cracking. So the protection, it would be, for example, S&P optionality. And, I, and then I might look in that portfolio and say, do I have uh, overly, am I overly concentrated to, let's say, technology? So I get some uh, QQQ puts as an, as an addition. Um, so for me, the summary is it's not necessarily more names. It's, it's grand opposing exposures. I want not just lack of correlation, I want negative correlation. So a long basket and a, and a, and a, and a long S&P puts, and both are traded. So uh, I'll trade the long basket and I'll trade the S&P puts because you can't just naively buy and hold puts. You, you lose too much money on, on the bleed. Um, so I'll trade them uh, and kind of have more size or less size relative to where I feel the market is. Uh, but so, so that that in itself becomes a, a an alpha generating uh, piece of the portfolio. It's it's trading around. It's using options as an instrument uh, to to trade the short side of the market while using an equity basket to to find high conviction winners. And that becomes a highly diversified portfolio. Where, as in this example, ten single names plus one index short is more diversified uh, because of the characteristics I've laid on top of it than a 200 by 200 portfolio. Uh, the characteristics meaning that I'm always I have exposure to both sides. I'm always using tight stop losses. And, and so all in all, the thing is more protected than some of these larger portfolios. I don't know if that all makes sense, but that's, that's I guess, the best answer I can give to, um, I, mean, I don't know if you have a follow-up. Yeah, I, I, I definitely understand what you're saying. You're looking to, uh, you know, protect the portfolio and and overlaid with positive convexity to uh, to keep you know to stay diversified. Whereas you know, we as trend followers, we would say, you know, to your point when you say the three hundred ninety ninth signal is a lower signal, we would say all of our signals have the same quality and the same expectancy. Therefore, we put them on, and and you know, if we can do that across a large set of diversified and maybe independent markets, then you know that's that's a great portfolio so that's that's why we follow it but i i see what you mean with those with those puts and just you know out, out of interest maybe this is just a side question but has it ever happened that say you you know you buy qqq's puts and you're long a basket of stocks i'm not sure how many stocks you're holding long but has, has it ever happened that you had a massive move down so an idiosyncratic move down on one of the long stocks that you have and not a move down in 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 the qqq so you have that basis risk and and then it you know plays against you at that point. For sure, I absolutely. I first let me just back up a second and say I, I completely agree with you and your your first part of the answer. Would the the difference in the trend following or CTA world that is that does not exist in the equity world is is the key word you use is independence. So w in picking a basket of equity positions in the S and P, the, the systemic exposure to the S and P is is is. Uh, very tight in in your world where the, not the 399th is an independent bet and and oil might have a lot less to do with gold than 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 two stocks in the s p have to do with each other and so i think i, I agree with you that in in that world it, it makes a lot more sense to have more bets and and they could each be equal because they 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 have true independence in in such varied markets uh, of course i i live in a smaller universe or, or a single market so there's not that true independence, and 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 so I have to do other things. Um, now going back to your question, uh, is do I find uh, the basis risk can hurt? Yes, absolutely, it happens all the time. Um, and so I, I think that uh, I mean there's a lot of ways to think about it, but if the convictions, if the if the bets are good. Um, then I know that's going to happen. I know that there's going to be an idiosyncratic event that's going to hurt one of my positions. It always does. Uh, and the question is, or, or, or not the question, the, the, the answer is that 
when that happens, you, you deal with it and you, you accept it as that's part of what happens. Um, and I, I, the other big piece, which I, uh, I shared earlier, but I didn't share in my example, is the example I gave you was a, a small name portfolio and, and some put optionality. That's, that's one of my strategies. So I have other strategies. And so the combined portfolio has a lot more going on. And I, I wouldn't put all, all my capital in one uh, strategy, certainly not in a, a long basket, certainly not just a long basket with S&P or QQQ puts, because um, that's not enough. Because there is, uh, uh, it, there are idiosyncratic events that create basis risk. So that, but with the other strategies in there, if if that whole strategy is looked at as a position, then there's other positions in a, in a total portfolio, and so that that event on a single name doesn't really hurt. And and of course, that's the other big piece of portfolio management is nothing is more than one or two percent of the total book and 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 therefore it can never wipe you out and that's that goes back to trading uncertainty is when we know we don't know then we can we can never have uh, uh, uh never take a large bet and i think sure it's a little bit different in in your markets um that you trade but i'm talking about single stock names um and so the idea of having conviction it just means that it's not going to be a you know, a 20 basis point position. It means it's going to be a 2% or a 200 basis point. So it's still, it can't hurt. But yes, those events happen. Yes, they disconnect with a QQQ or with a, or, or with a S&P. And, and you just accept it and move on. The question becomes, does that system you're using, or in my case, I, I ask myself, is the system I'm using still work? So if, if in the, I'm going to continue to use this example of a 10-name portfolio because um, I do run a portfolio like that uh, that has high conviction names. One of the 10 can have a bad event on the downside, and, and I, I stop out of it, and I'm gone, and I, I, and I roll into the next one. But I know because I've been trading that system for 20 years that that over time – the upside, the, the whole portfolio individually, they're, they're right skewed. So yes, the one of them will, will present itself in a, in, in, a, in, in a tail event. And let's just say it loses 20%. And it's a, I had this recently, it was an earnings miss and a, get, a stock I had gapped down 16%. But the rest of the portfolio did, the other nine did very well. And you know, I've had times where one name uh, last year, one name in two months was up 100%, was AMD. Um, so the opposite happens. As long as the right tail events are larger than the left tail events over time, then it's a winning system. And so everything, I think, comes down to that balance is understanding what are the risks and are the rewards greater by X, by X Y, or by X magnitude. And if, if the right skew is – if there's always more density on the right than the left of the distribution, then the thing works. So you, 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 you accept those left events. You, 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 you get out of them and move on, and over time, the, the right density plays out. And I, and I would say that most of the time, in my experience, when you get that uh, large move down, we, you know, we were long target the other day uh, on Friday, but that's not a good example because what I was going to say is when you get the big down move, it's still a profit. And so it's not even really a tail event in my mind. I would look at the trades themselves and say, oh, yeah, today's a tail event percentage-wise today or this month or whatever, but uh, it could just as likely be a profit. If you're using stop losses and making sure you're taking small losses, then it's very seldom do I risk a, a number of uh, ATRs that, that I want to, that it goes way beyond that. Agreed. And it could be a profit because you've been in it for a year or however long or six months. So it, it had a gap down today, but you're still exiting the position with a, a, a nice original basis or cost basis. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. And, and agreed on the ATRs um, for sure. Now, I think one of the things in, 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 in our world and certainly when, when we think about trend following, I think a lot of the time, um, you know, people who want to become trend followers or people who work in, in our field, uh, you, we think a lot about the the kind of the profitability or the alpha coming from the trades we take. Um, but I wanted to ask you, um, because I think you kind of touched upon it a little bit before, and that is, you know, if you, we think about portfolio construction as a source of alpha as well, so not just thinking about the, you know, on a trade-by-trade -trade basis, I'd love to hear you, uh, talk about sort of your findings and you know the, the you know what you know what's important in your mind when it comes to um, you know portfolio construction as as a source of of alpha and how that 
you know, is part of the, the bigger puzzle, so to speak. Yes, I absolutely love portfolio construction as a source of alpha and one that's not talked about enough and taken advantage of enough. Uh, I love it mostly because it's it's uh, I find it less decayable. Uh, and I, I know um, yeah, certainly arbitrage has it decays. People find good anomalies and, and they and they tend to get arbed away. Uh, trend following is not like that. It's I think it's a, a momentum slash trend is an anomaly that's that's here to stay. That seems kind of inherent in, in human nature. So, but um, the idea of portfolio construction deals with for me the the, the changing market regimes. And so, uh, the, as I think I touched not I think I, I know I, re, I recall I touched on this earlier is that the, the problem I faced. Uh, and this goes back to my earlier career, um, was that I developed something, it worked really well, and it, I, I, I did really well, and I thought I was great, and then it stopped working. And, and interestingly, it didn't totally stop. It just stopped for more years than I was, I couldn't see the future. So at the time, I thought it was, oh, this is over, and I, I had a good idea, but it doesn't work anymore. Little did I know it would start working again uh, because the, the core thesis was not problematic. It was just not the right regime for it. Uh, but what that lesson taught me, and as I said also, is that before, this is why I started developing other types of strategies, is that different things work in different regimes, and we don't know when the market's going to shift on us. So coming back to the portfolio construction side is what I love and what I do now and how I've evolved over 25 years of, of doing this stuff is having different strategies and using portfolio construction techniques to move between them based on the regime. So I, I'm going to um, use a word that all of you are going to like a lot, which is trend following, but trend following in sense of the sense of strategies, right? So if one has an arsenal, let's say of five different strategies, and one of them is literally trend following, and one of them is exactly the opposite, let's say it's mean reversion stat arb, right? The, so the question now is when is one in the trend? And when is the mean reversion stat arb trending in the market? When does that work better in a given regime? In a good example is in 2018, uh, particularly in February, there was high vol of vol, right? So you could be long vol and get hurt uh, because the market is whipsawing. And so you want a strategy that likes vol of vol, but not, not necessarily vol itself. Uh, and so in having an arsenal of different ones, you then use portfolio construction to, 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 to choose the trend of the market and, and, and overweight the strategy as a position in the portfolio that has that likes that type of regime, um, so it's like an overlay of portfolio level uh, trend approach. Uh, and I think, um, I, not I think, I, I've used this over many years now, and it's worked incredibly well. And I, I like it when I see. Uh, and it's, it's hard. The hard thing is, is to, of course, timing regimes. That's uh, uh, don't get me wrong. It's a very difficult thing. But there tends to be. Um, again, we're all going to like this. There tends to be trends in regimes, right? So regimes don't just come and go overnight. Um, it's like the the market is a little bit like uh, the Titanic, right? It it, it hit the the iceberg because it, it's so big it couldn't turn in time, and 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 that's what happens. The market is slow and really turns over slowly. And you know, is this bull market we've been in for ten years going to end? Yeah, maybe uh, the S and P here is is near the high from a, from six months ago. Maybe we're forming a, a double top. Maybe not, right? But it, it, the point is, it's taken six months to 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 even reach that that prior high, right? And so, if it is a double top, it's only going to pan out over the next six months that we're going to see that. So this this regime is 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 one that is wide and 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 takes time, and therefore. Um, Given time and given the duration of regimes, one can use portfolio construction. This is what I do now, uh, very much so, to 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 overweight systems or strategies that play better into um, very local environments. Do you do that just based on the profitability? Profitability, just some kind of a rolling return of each strategy, and saying, "Oh, it looks like the." The, you know, say trend following is is doing you know better right now, so I'm going to allocate a little bit more. How do you actually determine how to uh, size up or yeah. down the various strategies? Yeah, so it's, 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 it's trending, trending, right? <laughs> right, right. Um, yes. So no, it's I, I don't. I, I do look at um, just pure return, but this, I have a problem with pure return sometimes because it's very dependent on uh, time window. I actually had a tweet. Um, a couple of weeks ago where I made a point of saying that if you 
if you look at the, you know, people are saying that, you know, market's up, yeah, whatever, 16% over the last three months. Yeah, but if you go back another three months, it's flat, right? So with, with a difference of just three months, your return is fantastic in over three months, or it's nothing over six months, uh, literally zero. Um, over six months. So the, the, the problem with um, kind of rolling returns is the variance, um, given the, the starting point, is too high. And it's, this is the problem in a, in a complex dynamic system is you, you, you're, um, uh, where you start has a big difference to, to where, where you're looking at today um, and, and, and the different how the market changes over scale. So for, for me, I, I, I like that. And I, I, I mean, I like just pure percentage change. And I, I use that, but, but it's certainly not the, the core uh, thesis behind portfolio construction, or it's not the core uh, uh, um, uh, alpha source. I'd say the core is really, um, what are we looking at? We're looking at um, factors and characteristics of the market, um, kind of things I, I find I, I move in, in frequencies. Um, I find that, uh, or when I say I find, our R&D has found, uh, we've done a lot of studying of markets over the last 10 years uh, and found that there's, um, there's, there's frequency to certain kinds of strategies that, um, that if you look at really wide spans, they, they work and don't work and there's consistency consistency to uh, their kind of time in favor and time out of favor. And then there's certain factors that align that that give you a higher probability of what we call a phase shift when it's shifting from one regime to another. So if you if you looked at these characteristics, and, and when I say characteristics, it, it might be, you know, if I if I was in your guys's world, I might say if you're looking at interest rates and the dollar and, you know, so a, a basket of stuff and and you and you and you put this stuff in a quantitative way and, and you and you say, okay, when this bunch of stuff lines up, then then that that tends to be uh, the probabilities are, 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 are pointing towards a phase shift into this type of regime. And so uh, the, what we've done is actually built a, a big quantitative um, uh, approach. And so there's a lot of modeling going on of, of uh, looking at a bunch of factors and doing a bunch of analysis to, to these characteristics that, that help us identify when things are shifting. And uh, yeah, so I don't know if I, I, I'm trying to think about how to get into it more deeply uh, without getting to some of the proprietary side of it. But I, I think I've given a, a fairly good overview. I don't know if you have more questions. Sure. I can go deeper in certain areas. Well, I think the um, <clears throat> this is a fascinating area because we get asked all the time by clients and by friends and people on the podcast, how do I know it's not working any longer? Um, and I get the impression that um, it's the wrong question it's not going to work as often as you want it to because you're only doing one thing. Right. Uh, if you don't want to do something else, okay. But it could come back. I could tell you today, here's the metric. I have proven based on historical performance, it's not going to come back. Well, oops, it comes back. Um, you're so surprised by your how well it's done after a period of uh, not doing well. So the, the, the key here is try to find other ideas, other strategies exactly. that are different. And, and don't stop what you're doing that while you're waiting for it to come back. If you if you believe that it's fundamental to market behavior or human behavior, then you keep it there going, but you find something else that meanwhile is making money. And, and that sounds easy, but that's that's exactly what one should try to do in my opinion. I mean, it sounds, it's hard, but that, yeah. that's to me the only way to approach the markets because we could we could believe in something and, and, and it could really, it could be out of favor for 10 years. I mean, that, that's, that's a lifetime. <laughs> so uh, I think it's by necessity, um, one needs multiple approaches. Absolutely. Jared, do you want to continue? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'd love the tweets. And so I just would like to read a few and ask you to sure. comment, um, especially the ones I didn't really understand as much. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so CTAs and uh, the three of us, let's say, we're more um, pure trend following. We kind of think we understand uh, how it, the, the do's and don'ts of putting together systems and models. So I was particularly interested in this one and uh, your, your uh, explanation of, of this beyond what you wrote, and it was uh, the quant tug of war. Many assert that simplicity in modeling is key Occam's razor rules, but there's no deep reason that the market should obey simple rules. In fact, complexity can't be simple. The distinction is this. 
keep the thesis simple, allow complexity in executing it. I think uh, on this podcast, I and the, the other two guys, I believe, we were frequently on record as saying, you know, simple is better, uh, overfitting the past data with more bells and whistles and more accuracy, quote unquote, is something we try to stay away from. Right. And and that's the tug of war, <laughs> So, uh, which I, I would love to get into. So the, I, I completely agree that um, the less assumptions, the better. So that's one side of it, right? So that's you're on you have you're in a tug of war, and the one side says um, keep it simple uh, and and don't overfit. And I, I am of course um, uh, I could talk for a hundred hours about the problems of overfitting, uh, and uh, and and I believe that wholeheartedly. And and everything I've done is or everything we do and I've done for the longest time is. All so many measures to protect from overfitting because that is the danger. We 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 fool ourselves uh, too easily as as humans. So um, we we need uh, actually even protective measures to make sure we're not overfitting. At the same time, um, and this comes back to the tug of war, is that the markets are are complex, right? They they, they are nonlinear. So you, as an example, you can't use linear tools. If, if I want to be simple, I could say, well, let's just take the average move over the last, you know, X period. And let's look at rolling averages. The, the problem is that average doesn't at all represent uh, mathematically what's going on because there's nonlinearity. There, there, are, there, are, there are tails on both sides that um, bigger moves that one or, one or a few days can overwhelm um, uh, a, a year of behavior, you know. So, um, you know, I, in um, LA, as a, I, I live in LA, and someone can say, "Well, what's the average rent?" Well, <laughs> it depends if you live in West LA or East LA, and 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 so the average is this middle line, but they're two totally different neighborhoods. Uh, so it's the same thing here. As I have a problem with sometimes simplicity uh, it, it, that people think. To be to keep it simple, one should use simple techniques, and 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 so the expression of the tug of war is keep the idea simple, all right? Because you don't want to overfit, but you need to use more complex tools because the environment is so complex. Uh, and the easiest example of that is instead of using simple averages, look at mean, median, mode. Look at the whole distribution. Look at the shape of the distribution. To, to, I, I, I really, and I say this vehemently, I, I hate it when I see average because average dismisses that, that there is no normality in any distribution of any asset in, in the markets, right? All financial assets are skewed and, 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 and just have really strange shapes to them. Um, so by looking at the distribution, it's like, you know, you, you, you take your car to a mechanic and they want to look under the hood. And so they, they, they open it. They don't just look at the car and say, well, I think this is going on. They open it up and start looking inside. And that's what one has to do with, um, with, with, with financial assets is, is, is uh, use, uh, open it up, look at the shape of the distribution and use tools that work with that shape. And, and know, know, for example, just the skewness of, of anything that you're trading uh, versus just the average. And, and it goes further and further and further uh, down this, I'll call it mathematical road of complexity of the different tools one can use. Correlation is is horrible. Correlation is something that, and I, I mean this in a nice way, is, is, is it, it doesn't tell us anything. It, 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 uh, zero correlation, people love zero correlation, uh, but zero correlates half the time the, the, the thing can be exactly in the direction of the other thing because zero is half the time the same and half the time not the same. So 50% of the time, you're going gonna, you're, you're gonna to appear the same and, and, and there could be one move because correlation is linear. There could be one move that, that it, when they are moving the same way, that's so drastic, it makes the two things actually behave the same. And that's like when people say correlations come together during, during stress periods. Well, the, the, those things were always not independent, and the correlation that people assumed was just fooling them because they were looking at or using a linear approach. So, uh, again, there one might use a a rank correlation or a Man Whitney or I mean, there's a, a whole bunch of uh, different techniques out there. Um, but so what I'm advocating for is understand that it it's. It, 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 the ideas should be simple, but use tools that are appropriate for how complex the stuff that you're trying to do is. And uh, I hope that's an answer that gives you a lot more color into what that tweet was about. Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> there's another one, a recent one. 
quantitative analysis requires unbiased data, but this is remarkably, but this is in remarkably short supply. All of our data is biased to past events, i.e., to the particular way the history unfolded. To unbiased, we must resolve time dependence. God, we love having you, but we're we too are so humble because I think this is sort of out of my league a little bit, but uh, I can't wait for this answer. Uh, the problem with, and this goes very much back to the prior answer I gave, the problem with all um, studies of all financial assets is the infusion of time. Uh, and time is a, um, when, when statistics, uh, the, just the power of statistics is, is really with data that is not uh, a, a time series that's not time dependent. If somebody's measuring, you know, incidents of, uh, let's say, in the medical field, incidents of uh, how many m- people, uh, 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 a control group and and a, and a group that's taking some medicine, and how many people got better after taking this medicine who had some uh, form of some disease. The, the, it's not. There's no issue of time. There's the number of people that took it, the number of people that didn't, uh, and and of course the the ones who got better or not. No matter how long it took, they either got better or they didn't. There's these binary uh, discrete points that 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 you could look to in the statistical study. Uh, in the market, it's all everything is a function of time because we all move forward. And the problem is, um, it, 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 what has is described as what's called ergodicity, uh, which is that there's uh, any simple any single path that's happened is the path that happened along um, one trajectory of time. Uh, and if anything was different, uh, it, it would have been different. So I, I, people talk about, for example, over the last 10 years, we've had, uh, of course, QE. Uh, and so everything we look at over the last 10 years is unlike everything in the market for the prior 200 years, because there was never QE for 10 years. Um, and therefore, whatever we assess in the data is, is uh, biased to to no zero interest rates or you know or, or thereabouts, um, and therefore how reliable is it over the next ten years when if interest rates will start to move up that'll be will it be nothing like the last ten years and more like the the prior hundred years or not or, or et cetera et cetera and so um, in 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 a um, in a non ergodic world uh, which is the market uh, the, the 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 time weighted probabilities are, are not the, the expectancies. And, and so when we, an easy example, as we were talking about earlier, when we have bets and we take a 60-40 bet or a 55-45, right? We believe it's a good bet, but we, we were talking about the fact that there's idiosyncratic events that come out and there's a gap down. You, you mentioned Target and I had one last week of Xilinx. Um, the, the, these events are the, the pick we had was still a 55% probability or 60 or whatever positive expectancy we want to give it. The probabilities were there, but along this particular path, it gapped down. So the 45 occurred of the, of the 55, 45. And that's, that's why, um, that, that's the problem is that we can't rely on the probabilities because it, the, the, the law of large numbers requires millions of iterations for that probability to work out. Yeah, if we're flipping 10 million coins, then it'll be, you know, 50-50. But if you flip five, they can all be heads. And so we, we get to this problem of having um, the movement in time being a, a, a major um, single path that we're looking at in the past and the, the forward movement of time being a single trajectory that we have to deal with um, that might not, not, might not uh, align with the probabilities we're assessing. So, I, I, you know, th- there is no good answer to how to deal with that. Uh, one thing we do in our, in our testing is try to uh, extract the time component. And I, th- what, what we do is, you know, when we look at uh, f- a financial time series, it's every day. But if you, if you let's say, look at a, a stock every day over the last 10 years or five years, whatever it might be, and, and then you look at it in two-day chunks and three-day chunks and four-day chunks and, and, and 28-day chunks, um, and you look at intraday, and then, you're right, so you, 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 you kind of... Um, pull out different periods that you, you, you start to see how is this thing behaving independent of a particular window you're looking at. And that starts to extract the, the, the time influence outside of the, what the thing is doing. Um, so uh, I don't know if that, does that answer well enough the idea? Or? <clears throat> yeah, of course, I think so. Um, I think maybe I, I've said on the podcast many times I, uh, that I have a tendency to emphasize the trade stats 
are not the back test, the the, the, the pretend equity curve. Uh, you know, what's my average trade, my average win, my average loss, my win percentage. But I, and if that's sort of healthy looking, then let's go forward. But I don't expect the future to look like the past. Is that sort of similar? Uh, yes, I think any it goes back to uncertainty, right? Is if you know that the future is uncertain. Um, and in, in, in the, I, I believe in your example, um, you, you look at your stats, but you, as a trend follower with, with, a, with a good money management discipline, you're using stops. So by stops actually are a great way to deal with the unknown past or the biased past because no matter what happens, you stop out. So you're, you've synthetically created a protection around biased data. Right, because you, you've studied data, you said this thing should do what it, this trend should continue. But if it doesn't, I'm out five points lower. So it's 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 that that um, synthetic overlay is in fact protecting against the very thing that I'm talking about, which is that the that the past may not pan out, and therefore um, you've preemptively uh, ensured that if it doesn't, you'll move on in in a safe way. So I, I think yes, that perfectly aligns. Speaking about that, Wayne, are you using stops when you trade? I, I'm just coming back to, uh, you know, I think if I remember correctly, you said you're keeping uh, each position, uh, each, each position's risk to about 2% of book, and then trading 10 positions, I think. So it's a relatively concentrated portfolio. But are you using stops to protect yourself uh, with those longs? Yeah, so let me just clarify. Um, the each position of 2%, that's not that's across multiple strategies so that that one that the 10 names are actually a single strategy that is literally 10 percent per name uh, that's a uh and to make 100 percent, that is a whole strategy but that whole strategy going back to the portfolio construction alpha concept is one strategy that is smaller in, in, a, in a portfolio of strategies right so um it's not you know in that one strategy i allow 10 percent per name um, so I don't necessarily stick to two. I was saying on a on a if you step out one more level above, um, there's nothing more than two. Uh, but but I th th I do have some clients that invest only in that ten name portfolio. Uh, it's a high conviction portfolio, and they they have ten percent exposure per position. I also know that that's one of many uh, strategies that they might have. So it's not, of course, all of their money, and that would never be the case. But just to make the point that the 2% was in reference to a, a total portfolio view. So that being said, uh, you asked me about stop losses. It, it's actually different for different strategies. Um, and I, I think I, I, I do have a strategy that uses uh, fixed stops, but a lot of the time, it's not my preference. Uh, my preference is when the, I think I mentioned this earlier, is when the thesis is broken. Uh, and, and that's sometimes hard to tell, but that's the idea that I strive for. Uh, meaning, uh, if you, you get into a name, I, Jerry, you mentioned Target earlier. If Target had a bad day, Right. And but it's still doing exactly what you hope it would and should. And, you know, on that bad day, it, it, it stopped at a decent place and it, and it and it seemed to level off and it still fits whatever other criteria you originally assessed it for. Then then to me, it's not something to stop out of. If it's if it's broken the original thesis and doesn't and you don't believe that tomorrow is going to continue being as good as you originally thought, then then I stop out. And for me, it's that the price move itself tells us something it doesn't tell us enough but it's a there's the there's the part of it that's a protective measure if it if it moves by x amount then we have to be done just because it's too much of a risk but the the problem is that once that price move has happened right let's say it's a gap down of 10% on some uh, idiosyncratic event uh, let's say an earnings miss once that's happened it's already there right so you've already taken the loss mark to market you're in that position so now the question is is it is it as good from this moment forward as you thought originally if yes then stay if no then get out and so um, that's probably my number one view uh, I, that's not easy to do as I said before, because it's sometimes it's hard to assess if it's if you're in the same thesis. Um, but I, I, we we strive our best to assess that. Um, so you know, that's good. That's that's really good because you know, it's just so much different than the way we would look at it. You know, uh, by the mere fact alone that the price is down, that's enough, more than enough. <clears throat> and so this is once again, we're bringing up. Uh, another difference in an example. And uh, 
And, but we've often on this podcast talked about how, you know, we think that some of the ideas of trend and stop losses and being respectful of uh, the price trends and what's going on and not having uh, perfect information that should be picked up by stock traders. And uh, so it's, it's good to see our similarities with uh, your trading, but there definitely is some yeah. differences as well. By the way, the other thing I like a lot are time stops. So, you know, that if, if one can't decide, going back to what you just said, is price is very important. And I, I love price volume behavior. It's definitely, I, 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 I pursue it over any other, uh, any, I'll call it fundamental approach. Um, but if, if a stock has a, has a move down and, and it's hard to assess that thesis, for me, I, I have a time stop. So I'll say, okay, let me give it, uh, for argument's sake, two weeks. And, I'll, I, and if over the next two weeks, it starts to behave better and, and start to come back. And, and so it's, back to looking like the original thesis is being honored, then it's good. But if it's just misbehaving and it continues, then the price stop becomes the stop. So the, the, I guess the bigger point I'd make is I don't know at that moment what's happened after that, at, at the moment of that shock event. So I have to give it a little bit of time to assess. And uh, if, if, if it's not clear, then the default is get out. So the price does become the influence. If it becomes clear that it's a really healthy future, but it just had a moment of shock, then uh, I'm, I'm fine with it. And I, I, that's, I guess, a better clarification. I think this is just another example. Uh, we've often talked about um, <clears throat> what a disadvantage we think we're at because we don't have a story. And so it's not so much a story in a derogatory way. It's just that you have a thesis, you have something going on, and we're just like without anything except the price trends. And so maybe if I would have had your mentor and you'd have had my mentor, I would be a guest on this podcast and you would be one of the hosts. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But exactly. it's just kind of funny how we end up in these situations and uh, um, and we're so happy in our situation. <laughs> At least I am. And I think uh, Niels and Moritz are too. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's, and I, I think that goes back to that tweet. Also, is that the the past, right? There's only one past. So what we said about stocks and 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 or all financial assets, all capital markets are the same with ourselves. Like you, you had your experience and I had mine. So we are today two different people, and we cannot unwind our our time based trajectory and our experience along that trajectory from the decisions we make today. Uh, and that's exactly the, the the behavior of 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 of, uh, of instruments in the market. And I often tell people I have this bad analogy, uh, <clears throat> and especially with young people, I see today that there's so – I was a sponge as well, and I was just – whatever I would hear, and I would eat it up, and I would never rule it uh, out of the question. I would just store it away somewhere and say, I'm going to have to get back to that. It seems to contradict what I believe about the markets, what I've already learned, but I don't know. It's This is coming from a reputable source, and I need to – hold on to it. I think today um, I talk to young people and they're young traders and they're more likely to start arguing with me rather than uh, sort of saying, you know, well, let me think about that. Or maybe that's true, you know, coming from you, maybe I should actually listen. But uh, yeah, I think um, it's it's uh, a little frustrating to deal with uh, with these situations. Yeah. No, I agree. And I'll tell you what's interesting is if I look at one, um, that what my mentors said early on and getting back to advice is that this, my, my focus on risk was a lot about all the, 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 those comments. And I gave the, 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 kind of the, the bathroom story, um, but um, it, the commentary kind of paved the way. And I, and I was, I, I love the word you use, a, a sponge. Uh, so likewise, as a sponge, I, I took that in. And today when, when I, I do, I interact with some new traders um, on Twitter and I sometimes get these DMs uh, actually fairly often that uh, asking questions. And it's really interesting to me, the ones that um, want to absorb information and the ones that just want to kind of push their opinion and, 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 and uh, uh, kind of just, I don't know, if, if, if you agree, they're, they're, they wanted to talk to uh, to more if you don't agree they don't and i don't understand that i i i feel like it me listening early on had such a wonderful impact on my life um and 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 learning from mentors I, it's hard for me to understand how people don't uh but i guess everyone's just different so i i totally know what you mean on that and i sometimes it frustrates me when i get into those dialogues and i, I tend to move on towards the the people that want to learn um because I, I, I love that i love sharing the wisdom 
Yeah, you seem uh, very gentle to uh, some of the people who comment on your tweets. So uh, congratulations for that. I'm not quite <laughs> as gentle. Yeah, thank you. I, I, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I don't know, whatever in my past uh, may, uh, led me to be that kind of person. That's that's who I am. So, um, yeah. You know, all the uh, the successful people, the really successful people I've come to know, I think they, I'm sure they they haven't been just sponges in their early years. They continue to be sponges uh, for their life. That that's very journey, good right? addition, like, like a Charlie absolutely Munger, north of ninety yeah. years. Probably still is a sponge today. Um, reading, you know, talking to people, having an inquisitive mind. I think that's extremely important, especially when you deal with an object like, you know, the volatile and hostile markets, you know, which change all the time. And so you, you have to keep on learning and have to, you know, keep on questioning yourself where you may be wrong. Um, things like this. I think this is this is just, you know, ongoing and ongoing and ongoing. But And, and when you start talking about some of these issues, these uh, Ten Commandments of yeah. Investing and Surviving, it is just frequently this tug of war. Uh, I'm just against anything that is to um, this pat answer that, no, I've, I've, be, I've moved beyond that tug of war. I figured it all out, and that's what I'm like against. Uh, it's just this constant tug of war between these ideas, respecting those 10 or 20 rock-solid things that you need to believe in, uh, which, you know, you've talked about. One of our favorite is uh, the, the positive skew and the asymmetry and things like that. I and mean, that's, that's our life. That's where we live. And, uh, it, and there's no arguing about it. It's just how do you navigate it? Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, so, you know, it's, it's dangerous. Like we have those commandments and we stand by them. And that's like every time, you, you know, you hear people in the markets where they go like, I know better than that. It's really arrogant in, in a way you know and and maybe like you know jerry said it it's younger people may be saying that maybe they've never been trading through a large crisis or crises right maybe they've only seen one and brought up with an environment of just you know lower and lower interest rates and and kind of like easy trading from the long side in stocks maybe it's a good sign for us that when the when the next down move comes those people will reconsider their views on the market and they, they may be shaken out, leaving some massive trends for us to, to, to exploit them. Well, you know, we'll see when it happens. And I think the internet's a problem. Um, the, the analogy I wanted to give was, um, you know, when you have these mentors and you have people that you're learning from and you're learning good stuff and also you're learning from your own experience, uh, this is a great combination. And it's like, you can't become a Marine by reading a book. Yeah. And I think most of these people, they've read a book. Yeah, and absolutely. And I just think, okay, what if I would have just read the book and not had the experience? Oh, I'm, I'm frightful. I don't trust myself. I'm not that good. Uh, it wouldn't have worked out as well for me. So remembering 1984 through 1987, remembering those events and those times and those people, I still have the book as well, but so thankful that I have more. This is such an important point. And I think we've, we've never actually touched on that on that podcast is actually trading. Like, you know, this is what you remember. This is what hurts. This is the pain that you inflict every once in a while on yourself is by having those positions on, looking at the screen, seeing the negative P and L, you can only get that and become a better trader and like you know jerry was saying become the jerry that jerry is today by actually trading there's no theoretical exercise in that and there's no substitute time, yeah it's like you know i you know you speak to people that you know develop trading strategies and they you know do a back test of this and they do a smart beta fund of that and you know they come up with those systems and those ideas and and then they put it on papers and white papers and they they kind of like they speak as if they trade the thing. But when you ask them, did you ever actually trade it? Do you trade this? Or do you ever have you ever traded a futures contract in your life? And they go, no. But they've developed that system. And they think that they've developed something that's really good. And they, they want you to look at that and, and trade it. And I go, like, you know, we can have, we, we can end that discussion right here. You know, <laughs> if you're not trading that thing, 
if you've never traded in your life, then really there's no business for us to speak about those type of systems. Well, we can, yeah, we, absolutely. We can take it a bit uh, further than that because I think there's a, a, a lot of people in the financial media who have never traded anything in their life and they are very quick to conclude, for example, that the markets have changed and that trend following, um, you know, will never work again, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, which leads me, right, which leads me to kind of your view on, uh, on, on market structure, changes in market structure, Wayne, you touched upon it a couple of times saying, I've got this strategy that's still running after 21 years, but it didn't work all the time. Now, I would say for the most part, uh, you know, working for a firm that's been in business successfully for, for more than 45 years, having worked with Jerry and, and, and seeing his amazing results in, in these markets, the trend following is one of those strategies that will continue to work, but of course, doesn't work every single year, um, but probably in more years than, than, than many other uh, strategies. So, how how do you think about or how do we help investors understand that just because a strategy doesn't work for you know um you know a year or two that it doesn't mean that it's broke and how do we kind of fight back uh these assertion by people who has never traded uh where they're very quick to uh you know conclude that because markets change which they do all the time that certain strategies, you know, go completely out of out of uh, favor or out of sync. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, markets changing is funny. They they, they don't change because um, I'm a big believer that um, I said this earlier that markets are just a bunch of humans making decisions, and of course that's what it is. And humans don't change, so markets don't change. What what we what it does is it goes through different kinds of regimes. Um, and, and some of those can last a long time. Um, I always find it funny that I look at um, you know, the, 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 one of the great investors of everybody's praise is Warren Buffett, um, but who, who went through a decade of underperformance of the S&P, and, uh, but he still is the famed Warren Buffett, right? So uh, there people didn't seem to have a problem with his 10-year um, weaker performance, and he, he decided not to invest in any technology because he didn't understand it, and you know missed one of the greatest bull runs in history. Uh, but still, he's Warren Buffett, so he he gets a pass. Uh, but a lot of other strategies don't, um, and, and and it's a strange thing. I think you know you, you, you're asking how do how do we educate people if if you don't have that uh, if they don't have that understanding? Um, it, it's really hard. I, I I mean I spend a lot of time really more with institutional uh, people that understand that. And so I don't have to sit there trying to convince people. But do you think that, do you think institutions really understand it? Because I think very often institutions, uh, you know, they spend years studying 30 years of data to get into a strategy and then they redeem after one or two years because, okay, it didn't really work. Like we saw with trend following, uh, you know, people rushed into it in 2009 after sure. grade 08 and, People have been, you know, quick to get out after a couple of years because it didn't quite work as well, you know. So I, I, I mean, yeah. I agree with you that, of course, institutions generally and certainly, uh, you know, fortunately for us, I mean, we work with institutions who really do understand this. But I think still a lot of people, even at the big shops, they um, – and maybe it's just because they have to show – performance they have to they don't want to go into a quarterly uh you know investment committee meeting and having to defend this strategy that seems to be losing more often than winning i mean maybe we're down to that simple uh point about the fact that trend following is a hard strategy to to own because returns are lumpy etc cetera, etc cetera. maybe maybe that's uh, you know plays in but i i see it across the board about you know um, people quick to to deem trend following, um, you know, quote unquote, dead. Yeah, you know what? I, I I think you hit the nail on the head on that last one. It's about you know the 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 job comfort or stability of of all the people making the decisions. And I I have actually an even tougher 
uh, strategy than than trend following that I think is one of the best strategies I've I've ever had, and I, I, this is my favorite one, which is a tail strategy. It, it's I, I spent five years developing the thing. It's incredible. It's uh, uh, it, it, but it it only makes money when uh, when markets fall. Uh, the rest of the time, the the beauty of it is that unlike most put holding strategies, it doesn't bleed, but it doesn't make money, right? So you can sit there. You know, the the good example is in uh, December of of eighteen and. Uh, a couple of months ago, I think for the month it was up like 20% or something, right? Because it's long put optionality on the S&P. So, of course, it's going to make a fortune. But then come January, the S&P is up 9% or 8 whatever it was. Um, and it was basically flat. But in my mind, that's incredible. That's the best thing I've ever seen. <laughs> like I can't – I'm trying to tell these institutions this is the most amazing thing since sliced bread. But – you're like, but if the market's up and now it's been up for four months straight since the beginning of the year, well, it's underperformed and it's flat. But I, you have to try to tell people, but flat is incredible because it's sitting there waiting for this massive right skew payoff, and 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 it's just hanging out while it's waiting. And you know, so I I have that same problem in 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 this in that thing, which is, but it's even worse because it you you you, uh, you know trend following you can still uh, make money a lot of the time where in when you're fighting the S and P on being long S and P puts you, you, you it's very it's you're, you're most of the time not making money uh, and but very rarely making enough to pay for five years of waiting. Um, so I, I know that pain, and I think what it comes down to is exactly what you said is. Is is the the people that you're talking to, and and really the most of them say uh, they have to report to boards, and those boards are really just people who are having to report to hundreds of investors or thousands of investors, and and when the statement comes out every month, the investors are asking about the one that's flat or down, and that's all they. So at the at the long end of the chain is the less uh, informed consumer. Who you know? So even though to your point, when we deal with quote unquote institutions, the institutions are are answering at the end of the day to the collective consumer who are all reading their statements and 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 coming back, and then that's going up the chain to the board and back to the portfolio manager who says, no, I don't want any of this in my portfolio. At the same time, I have found that there are some institutions, and these are my favorite ones, who who totally understand what each strategy should do. And there, my answer to you is going to be that it's all about setting expectations uh, and, and knowing that the person who you're who's on the other side of the table from you is is one that understands those expectations and buys into them beforehand. And so if I, if I went into someone on the tail strategy and said, hey, listen, you can be flat or down for the next two years, but when if the markets crack, you're going to be up you know, fifty percent. Well, if that's what they buy and they get it, and they and you go through that conversation, then 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 you're probably good for a, a while with them. And I, so I find that it's about the, uh, I'll call it education, upfront and setting expectations for what this thing is and what it's not. And if they're a sophisticated buyer that 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 accepts that and understands that and asks the right questions and comes to the point of saying, yes, that's what I want, then, then for me, that's been my best experiences. Uh, when I get those, uh, even institutional allocators that are, that, that in the end, I know they're going to have to go back to a board uh, or, or to a answer to someone else who's going to just point to this return number on a piece of paper, then I, you know, for me, I, I've never found a great way to to deal with that other than to say, do I want to actually have this client? Uh, is it worth it? Um, and I, I, you know, I, that's maybe not a great answer, but that's that's from my experience. It's it's rather spend the time to to be, to work with people who 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 who. Uh, who fully appreciate what it is that they're getting. Uh, but if, if it's anything on our side, it's to educate and set expectations in that education for what the strategy is supposed to do and when. I mean, of course, I think it's the absolutely right answer that you give there, Wayne. Um, and I think, you know, probably the three of us and many of our peers do exactly that. Um, but but still, I would say that, uh, you know, what, what people say at the beginning of their investment and, 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 and what they say after a year of flat or negative performance is not always uh, the same. And of course, uh, I think our, our side of the industry, at least, uh, have been further uh, challenged by be becoming, you know, labeled, uh, you know, crisis alpha. I mean, everybody thinks that Whenever there's a little bit of a wobble, it's a crisis, and we should produce alpha, and and that's that's challenging. Um, they want our strategy to to look like uh, Wayne's strategy that makes a lot of money when the S and P goes down, and 
we're offering great amounts of diversification. 75% of the markets we trade, let's say, are not stocks. And and then sometimes we'll be short stocks, but we still cannot uh, help out reliably when they, you know, the last two crashes that were not really crisis, that were more February and, and late last year, they were more uh, mean reversion. And uh, Whipsaws. Now, exactly. Yeah. Now, I don't want to be a party spoiler, but just to mention that in the interest of time, we've already been going for an hour and a half. Um, and although we did ask our our audience, our tribe, um, you know, what about this thing about, you know, how long should we be going on every week? And and most people actually came back and said, you just keep going on for as long as you want. So that's probably <laughs> what we're going to do today. So we'll we'll keep on for a little bit longer, but just keep that in mind, uh, Jerry and Moritz, in terms of sort of finding you maybe uh, some of the, the key questions you want to raise with Wayne uh, before we, we wind down. But but let's do a, another round and, and see uh, what comes back. Yeah, I, have a, I have my fi- uh, final, okay. final uh, question slash comment. I'm going to combine two of my favorite Wayne tweets. Um, we, we really like these. Uh, assessing positive skew strategies with Sharp is like telling the world heavyweight champion he's a weak athlete because he runs a slow marathon. I like that. That's it's cool. Um, and then you another tweet you end by saying the conse- uh, lower probability with minor co- consequences outperforms higher probability with drastic consequences. So maybe sort of a similar sentiment. Uh, and so I guess my question is, uh, do you f- find that idea hard for institutions and for uh, smart people who are, are allocating money who may not be trading uh, uh, traders will probably love it, but do, do the allocators, can they embrace that? Do they kind of like it? Um, and if so, maybe uh, the CTA's problem is we're just not, uh, when we start talking about commodities and stuff, we're just like losing people. And then having a strategy that's positive skew and taking small losses uh, might be more acceptable is this is the question do you think it's more acceptable in a stock only world hmm yeah i think my experience um uh, over the years has taught me that most people want um the the frequent positives they so i think you know i'll, I'll answer that negative skew dominates the the markets or the investor market um, in, in that there's the the higher hit rate and once in a while a left tail right um, a heavy left tail so um, I, I that I think it's much harder to convince investors uh, the value of right skew to answer your question directly I think because innately people want to see this positive p l all the time and you know if you know as, as they, they there's this old school um you know the, the ratio of you know fixed income versus equities should be um i heard this uh, i don't know decades ago should be uh, somewhat associated to your age so when you're 70 you should have 70 percent fixed fixed income 30 percent uh, or 70 percent bonds 30 percent stocks um and, and which which kind of just the fact that that's an old adage or an old idea um time tested is that as people get older, they want more of that just fixed coupon. Uh, I think it's so in our in our natures to to want to see that money coming in, and you know, there's this chase of yield. Uh, years ago, it was with uh, MLPs, and uh, and then it's uh, more recently with REITs. Uh, there's everybody just wants to see that coupon coming in, and that's you know that, that's uh, unfortunately in 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 the markets most of the time that has negative skew to it. Uh, but but people discard the rare. Uh, bad consequence or bad event because they get paid every month, um, and that's the that's that's the predominance of of of, of who we are as humans or, or, or of our nature. So, um, to to sell the positive skew is very difficult. It's very hard to convince people. But I, I try to. I think institutionally it's easier. Uh, I, I try to spend a lot of my time. Um, explaining why it is so much better, and it, it's just uh, for every reason. Is what's it's so interesting is that with, uh, and you guys know this all too well in in, in the CTA world is that a, a single year um, 
can can pay off more than the last five years of small losses, right? And that and it's just about being patient, and even more so when that single year is the tragedy of the world, such as 08, right? And people so quickly forget in 08, everyone's just in so much pain, but a lot of CTAs are doing incredibly well, right? And and so they're you know, that that's exactly what it's for. And going back to uncertainty. It, it, we we never know when that's going to happen, and and I, I don't think 08 is going to start tomorrow, but who knows? Um, or or the you know 1987 20 22 percent gap down, well, whatever happens, we we don't know when it's coming, and uh, so I think it's it's the the job of us convincing people that right skew is better than uh, left skew is is making is really educating about uncertainty and how much how good they felt in 08 if they had CTA exposure and how necessary it is to have that complement to any portfolio and all these people that want to watch that coupon come in every month have to have to be taught <laughs> that, that uh, it's just you know it's there till it's not um and um and yeah it's a, it's a hard job but i think it all comes down to education um yes i don't know if if that's the Great. yeah yeah, and maybe we shouldn't be so discouraged because uh, as long as the majority of the world thinks that way, we could. it's probably going to enhance our success. I, I think so. I think so. I, I think um, it, it should enhance it, for, but it, it's still a hard uh, uphill battle of education. Um, but yeah, it, it should. I think uh, the fact that what you're saying is that the because so many people are concentrated in trying to find trades in the other area, there might be more available alpha in 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 uh, in the right skew area, and that's possible. Um, yeah, I just I want to give an anecdote uh, in this uh, uh, area for for a moment. Is I remember uh, I don't know 20 years ago or so. I went in to get um, this eye surgery, uh, the LASIK, right, and uh, I had. Uh, um, so I'm sitting there with an eye doctor, and uh, I'm asking him what are the what's the risk that one can go blind with, with this uh, at the time um, with this new LASIK te- technology, um, and it was just coming out of that. It had been out for a few years at the time, um, and he says to me, "Oh, don't worry, that's that's only like one in a million. And so I looked at him and I said, "What do you mean, don't worry? Uh, don't worry unless I'm that one." Um, and I. I when I, you know, and he looked at me like I was crazy, but that's not like it's easy to say not to worry unless you're the one. Um, the the point being is that I, I, why I gave that uh, story or why I shared that anecdote is I think that there there are perhaps types of personalities. I'm one that thinks about the outliers more, and I think maybe on average when I meet people. Um, they they're not so into the outliers. Uh, they're they're more about you know what, what's happening and what what have you done for me lately and that kind of thinking. And I, I think there's just a a group of of uh, I don't know maybe it goes back to the mentors and or maybe it's just a natural the way we're born and our brains work is are you an outlier thinking thinker or not or or is that in your head all the time? Um, and if it is, then you love right skew. And if it's not, then then it's just something that you you kind of just don't see. And so um, I you know I hope education. Uh, carves the path there, but perhaps it just you know requires that um, somebody has that type of thinking or not. I, I don't know to be honest. Do you have an opinion on that? Uh, it's, yeah, well, I remember probably one of the first articles I ever read about trend following. Nineteen eighty-eight, around there, was uh, someone making the case that because the performance was dominated by outliers then that was unreliable and to be avoided. So I don't know. I I just know that when I first heard about trend following and I heard about taking small losses, going with the trend, respecting the trend, um, hanging on to your winners, diversifying longs and shorts. I I was 21 years old. I thought this is the greatest thing ever. I, like you, was interested in stocks and trading and strategy and I thought, I mean, I like stocks. I don't even know about commodities, but I guess it's diversification. I guess shorts sound pretty good. Leverage, I mean, I, I don't know. I was totally open-minded and into it. And uh, the continuous CTA refrain is we need to do better education. Well, I certainly didn't need any education. Right. I think that sometimes you just got to say this is so – It's at the same time, it's awesome and it's great to have these markets and have these strategies that we've talked about today. 
it, it's it's not unbelievable that you were in the minority to really really like them, and so embrace that and whatever that means for your business or whatever. It's probably it, for me. It's just it's just so much fun to have that knowledge, regardless of how much money I manage or. I could not agree with you more I, on, on the so much fun part. It's, a, it's almost not even caring what the rest of the people think of just knowing that it, it is truly better. And, and so you do it <laughs> and you have fun with it. And, you know, life's short, so you got to do what you love. I agree with that. Life's short. Yes. Final question for me. Um, you know, it wouldn't be the Systematic Investor Podcast if we didn't bring up uh, the word uh, vault control at least once in, on, on the show. Otherwise, our listeners get probably angry with us if we don't. But no, jokes aside, um, back to the kind of like you know, we can just use this, this as a point for orientation, the portfolio that you mentioned with the 10 stocks. Like, you know, uh, Neil, Jerry, and I, with, with our trading, we normally size positions as a function of their, you know, historic volatility, right? So our lean hawks position is typically smaller than our position in you arrive or futures, sure. right? Does does the same concept have have an application in your trading? Like, would you say that your you know like Tesla position is is a smaller size than your Coca Cola position, or how do how do you construct that setup for you? Yeah, um, that's a good question, and I think I, the the answer is it, it's it's in part. So sometimes I have some strategies that do, and some that don't, and I so I can talk from either side of it, and that's part of the I'll call it the portfolio construction alpha that we were talking about earlier is, um, and part of this grander idea of uncertainty. So why do I like vol sizing? Because of course it, it makes sense. You have to normalize to how much this thing shakes or, you know, what, what, what the, what the quote unquote risk can be at the same time. I don't believe that vol necessarily equals risk. Um, you know, so, some markets are more volatile, but, but they tend to snap back more consistently than other markets. So would you, you know, would you rather be down five um, percent but have it last a year, or down ten percent but you're back in two days, right? So it's not necessarily the size of the move. Sometimes it's the it's the the, the time associated with the asymmetry, um, and and so I I I, I like. Um, you know, I mean, there's whether you use vol or ATR. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different methods to saying uh, what, what, how much does this thing move, and 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 therefore weighting a portfolio by that potential movement. And I, I think that's a good use of a tool for a portfolio that can benefit from that normalization. At the same time, I don't. I have other strategies that I don't find that that normalization works or is necessary because it's so noisy. So in in Perfect example, because we've talked about it a lot, the 10 name portfolio, for me, those 10 names are equal weighted. And the reason actually goes back to exactly what you guys were talking about earlier is I don't know which one is the better signal. So I have to all give them equal weight. And I don't know whether whether uh, volatility didn't play a role or because it, it wasn't a metric in in the picking, right? So uh, I can't fit to volatility afterwards because I did not use volatility in the signal itself. So if volatility hasn't been used for identifying what I'm going to buy, then it shouldn't be used in, in shaping the future of what, 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 of, what I've, of what the signal has chosen. And so that the purity of that particular strategy mandates that I don't vol normalize. It could be any one out of the 10. That, so that strategy, as I explained earlier, is high conviction and it very typically one, two, or three out of the ten make a, a magnificent upside move, have a tremendous right skew, very much in the world of of, of the CTA approach. So, and, and I've had this, and I, I used the example last year of, of my AMD was up, I think, about a hundred percent in two months. That that's insanity for in the equity world. And the thing is that hasn't been the only, I've, I've named it, I've mentioned it twice on today's show uh, or to, on today's podcast, but there's been many names over the 20 years of running this particular system that that do that. And so whether the thing, whether AMD and whatever sat next to it that that month in, in, in the other nine names, whether the vol was 1% different or 3% different is of no consequence relative to the 100% move it made, uh, which is the magnitude of the move is so much larger than whatever vol normalization I would have done. So th in that particular strategy, I know that vol doesn't make a difference. I know that ATRs don't make a difference. I'm picking 10 things, one or two or a few of which are going to explode on the upside because that's the that's the indicator signal set that I've looked for. Therefore, sizing has no place. And let me give them each equal positioning. 
come to a completely different strategy where vol is part of the assessment, uh, then I like to use some form of vol normalization. But I, I'm, I'm weary of it because past vol is not necessarily future vol. That goes back to the tug of war uh, of, of statistical analysis. And so when I look at vol, I don't look at, for example, standard deviation. I, I will look at the shape of the left tail and I, we, we have, um, we use um, actually a, a, a form of a stochastic calculus to, to, to understand the, the, or compute the, 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 the real shape of the tail. And then we'll normalize to that shape because that's what really empirically, that's what's happened in the past. That's how this thing's behaved. So sometimes the, the, the vol itself is, is a little bit off from how uh, much the thing will move you know, just a little bit. Let's say it moves a little bit down a lot of the time, but has really bad moves uh, even more rarely than something else. Uh, so to me, that that deserves a little bit better uh, or more exposure than something else that has very few little downs, but but more frequent big bumps. I, I, that's a bad example, but I, I'm trying to convey the idea. Uh, so so I like to look a little bit more deeply, but certainly there's a place for that uh, in a portfolio uh, where that's been part of the signal, uh, and, and that's where I'm differentiating the two. Is does, does, does vol matter to the to the thesis? And if it does, then yes, normalize. If it doesn't, then don't. And I think each has a place. Now, I'm going to do something different. I will save my final question to next time we have you on, Wayne, because I have a strong feeling that this is not the last time with all that wisdom you you can uh, you share with us. Um, now, as we start to uh, wrap up, let me just go through, uh, as we normally do, uh, performance uh, for the CTA industry. Uh, as of Thursday uh, this week, uh, I think Friday was a good day for the industry. So just keep that in mind. Uh, the BTOP 50 index up 3.04% for the month of April, up 478 for the year. The SOCGEN CTA index up 2.62% for the month, up 4.6% for the year. Uh, SOCGEN trend index up 4.09%, up 7.10% for the year. And the SOCGEN short-term traders index uh, up 20 bips uh, for the month and down still for the year, down 1.6%. And finally, the Bridge Alternatives index up 3.44, up 4.41 for the year. Um, and also as we uh, wrap up, I mean, some of the things we talked about today, obviously super interesting um, and 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 just uh, looking through uh, your uh, Twitter feed just now, Jerry, actually, um, I noticed that you recently, I think maybe yesterday, was tweeting about the the longest stretch ever of Warren Buffett's in terms of underperformance. So it's not just trend following that doesn't always find, uh, you know, the swing of things. Seems like every strategy can have periods like that. Um Wayne, before we wrap up completely, I would love to ask you just in terms of any resources, whether it be books, other podcasts, or things that you would recommend our listeners uh, to uh, to check out. Um, anything that has been uh, really useful, really influential uh, for you? Um, yeah, that's I get asked that a lot on Twitter. Um, people DM me a lot for stuff to read. And I, I first, I want to go back to, I think Jerry said it earlier, uh, and it was actually one of my tweets also in, in a recent month where I said the, the best way to learn is trade, 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 trade. Um, I, I, if that, I think Jerry, you, you, I think you uh, retweeted it. Um, yeah. So for me, the answer is number one, do it. <laughs> like just continue doing. And there's nothing, and, and this was talked about earlier on today's podcast, is there's nothing better than the activity itself uh, for learning um, and, and studying one's losses and studying the behaviors and just l really looking deeply into everything that happens that you do as you execute, noting why you did it, what you did, what you looked at. Um, so understanding oneself, I think, is that, and, and why one takes took the actions they took is the absolute best book in the world um and uh outside of that uh external resources i mean i i i love white papers at the same time i have the problem as you said earlier that the academics who write them oftentimes have never traded so they all get very theoretical but ideas that don't often work in the markets uh but it's a it's a, certainly a good source of 
of information and if it's filtered properly, uh, I love the white paper universe, um, um, but one has to trade concurrently to know what works and what doesn't versus what's just purely academic. Um, and then in terms of just books, you know, I don't have any ones that I love dearly because uh, I have so many. So I don't have any, uh, I'll call it highest ranked. Um, one of the ones I read a few years ago that stuck with me for a long time uh, as a trader, uh, and I think I read it, I don't know, 10, more than 10 years ago, is called The Way of the Turtle. Um, and it was this group of uh, um, traders at a, at, a, at a prop firm, and all of them, uh, it, what was interesting is that the that, that head guy said that they all came in and they were all taught exactly the same rules. And this is what you do, this is how you enter, this is how you exit, this is what you look for. And yet they all traded differently and they all had different P&Ls and some blew up and some didn't, but they all had the exact same set of information. Uh, and so, and there was something, I, I, I don't know why, but it, that taught me a lot in, and I thought about that a lot and I've, it, that a lot more has to do with human nature um, and ourselves versus books. So I think read that book <laughs> to understand why that's the case and then understand yourself and read yourself and your actions uh, while you continue doing and you can't get better educated than that. Absolutely, and 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 with Jerry being one of the turtles, I'm sure many of our listeners have uh, have already read that book. Wayne, thank you so much for spending your Sunday morning uh, with us. We really appreciate it, as I'm sure all our listeners uh, have done as well. And you are absolutely as inspirational to listen to as you are when we read your tweets. Uh, so it's been a real treat for us. Um, and of course, thank you. Let me. Uh, let me suggest uh, to all our listeners that they go and follow you uh, on Twitter. Maybe you can just repeat, uh, you know, remind uh, our listeners of your Twitter handle. It's just my first and last name, Wayne Himmelsheim. Uh, last name is kind of tough, so I'll spell it out. Uh, obviously, first name Wayne, W-A-Y-N-E, Himmelsheim, H-I-M-E-L-S-E-I-N. Wayne Himmelsheim is my handle. Fantastic. And there's definitely uh, a daily dose of financial poetry if you go and subscribe to, to Wayne's Twitter. We're going to be back uh, next week with our usual format. So keep your questions coming by sending them to info at toptradersonplug.com or send us a tweet. Uh, and of course, make sure you subscribe to the the Top Traders on Plot podcast to be sure you get all the new episodes directly to where you prefer to listen to uh, podcasts. On that note, we're going to wrap up this week's uh, conversation longer than normal. We uh, hope you uh, are okay with that. And if you feel you get some value from uh, these conversations, please do share them with your friends uh, and followers. Of course, uh, we're always grateful if you would leave us a rating and review on iTunes because it really does help others, uh, you know, discover the Systematic Investor Series. So from Wayne, Jerry Moritz and me, thank you so much for listening and we look forward to being back with you next week. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.